I don't know what it was. Never mind. Go ahead. No. Oh, Emily's here. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, uh, welcome to uh, Fruit Plant Maintenance, uh, and I'm Matt Bunch. So a uh, little bit about me. Uh, I actually grew up in Lawrence, so uh, know this building, know this facility, played baseball over uh, over in the field. I don't know, are they still over there? Um, uh, and, and worked uh, as a horticulturist for the city of Lawrence, used to work at Sunrise Garden Center, uh, have been doing this line of work since 1994. Uh, and now, uh, and with an organization called uh, Kansas City Community Gardens, and the specific program is the Giving Grove. Uh, the Giving Grove is both a national organization, but locally in Kansas City, we uh, work with a number of community groups and have installed over 230 micro orchards uh, throughout the Kansas City metro area. We actually uh, work here in Lawrence with the community garden group, the, the Little Prairie Community Garden uh, behind Hallmark over there. Uh, we've, we've helped install some trees over there. So um, this is all about uh, uh, fruit plant maintenance and uh, sort of some helpful tips and what you need to do to maintain fruit plants. They're not exactly the easiest things to maintain. These, uh, these are not ornamentals. Uh, nor are they native plants. I saw you guys had a, a couple of fruit trees, a couple of apple trees out there. Uh, as you know, they're, they're not easy to manage. Pawpaws, on the other hand, may be a little bit easier and rewarding because you get the zebra swallowtail butterfly. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about, let me, let's see, let me get this so I can move the slides. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, the way I'm, going to structure this is we're going to talk about the maintenance during the early years of a fruit tree because that establishment is of course very important but it's almost a little bit like a honeymoon phase for your fruit trees because really you're not getting fruit on them uh, or if you do get fruit you should be pinching those fruits off um, it's once you start getting the fruit where everything goes for that fruit uh, well, we'll go over pruning details because if you're not pruning your fruit trees, let me just pull out some of, uh, a couple tools of the trade too. If you don't have some number two Felcos, you might need them. And if you don't have a silky saw, uh, you should have one of these. Maybe hold those up for the, the folks there online. Uh, number two, Felco hand pruners, uh, kind of the horticultural industry standard. Uh, these will go through three to three quarter inch wood fairly easily. Uh, they make a lot of different models, Felco does. So if you're left-handed, you could even have left-handed hand pruners. There is no left-handed saw, however. Uh, that's just part of the deal. Um, so, but this is a silky, uh, silky saw comes with the scabbard, comes with a little belt clip so you don't lose it. Uh, this, it's like butter through, uh, through two inch limbs. Really, really handy for what I do. And if you have any fruit trees, these will be incredibly handy. Uh, we'll go through maintenance during the fruiting years. And then uh, we will touch on insect and pest management. Uh, and, and really, you know, I say touch on because there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> the fruit trees are not easy, but they are very rewarding. Uh, as we all know, fresh fruit is great to have. Uh, some of this is, is just kind of a no-brainer. We're all kind of gardeners here, so we get it. Um, but when, uh, when I'm talking the pruning and training supplies, having those Felco number twos, having a silky Zubat, having loppers, I don't like to use loppers in a tree because you never get a clean cut, but sometimes people need loppers to be able to reach something. I use loppers in the blackberry patch. Uh, rubbing alcohol, that's really important for sterilizing your equipment between plants. And oftentimes you might be dealing with a fruit tree disease like a fire blight, for example. Well, if you're cutting out fire blight, you wanna make sure you're sterilizing your 
pruning equipment before you make another cut. We'll talk a little bit about fire blight later. Um, some of the other stuff, you know, yeah, this is all, this all gardening. Um, having a sprayer, having a dedicated sprayer for insecticides and fungicides, that's important. And the more fruit trees you have, the larger the sprayer you will need. So having a four to five gallon backpack sprayer, especially one that's battery powered, uh, that can really save you out in the orchard. Um, having that battery power means you're not constantly pumping the sprayer and you will need to get up in the tree a good uh, sometimes 10 to 15 feet up in the tree because these things do grow. And then orchard ladders. Uh, orchard ladders, it's, I know a lot of people are afraid to get on a ladder and the older we all get, I get it. Um, but there are uh, manufacturers of orchard ladders, uh, Stokes in particular, really nice flared wide base and a telescoping third leg. Uh, these things are super safe, uh, super effective at getting up into a tree. So forgive the somewhat smallish print. Uh, so I, I, this, I do have this, uh, this will go out as a PDF later on this week. This is the, uh, this kind of our standard monthly fruit management calendar. And this just goes through month by month, what you should be doing if you have these crops, what you need to be thinking about with these crops. Um, so January, you know, January, that's, that's, you don't have to do much of anything. You, you do a little bit of reading up on your trees. Maybe you you water, maybe you order more trees. Uh, February, you start getting into pruning season. That's definitely pruning season. And, and into March is still pruning season. Uh, tending, uh, pruning your peaches and pruning your blackberries is really what, <coughs> what you wanna focus on in early March, right before they break bud. Um, you now expanding mulch rings, things like that. Uh, and then, you may start uh, spraying at this point. February and March, this is typically a good time to be applying dormant oil sprays. And dormant oil sprays are something that, there are organic formulations of dormant oil sprays. Uh, you could even use canola oil as a dormant oil spray. This is something that ends up smothering uh, either overwintering insects and or eggs that could be hatching on some of your trees. And if you don't think you don't have some of these pests, you probably do. Um, now fruit trees are one of these things where when you plant them, the insect comes. Uh, there, it's, it's just, it's without a doubt. We are, we are still in the range of all of this insect activity from various various mites to midges to uh, codling moth, oriental fruit moth. We are just in that range. You know, you get out, out west past Manhattan, you know, the prairie kind of kind of kills out a lot of that. They, the ecosystem is not there for a lot of those other fruit pests, but we're still very much like the Eastern part of the country when it comes to all of these fruit pests, we do have them. Uh, so April, you know, April is a, a very busy time uh, for in the orchard, April and May especially. And this is kind of a, a high time to be doing spraying. Um, it's also once you start getting fruit set, it's time to start thinning fruits and things like that. I'll go through some of this very explicitly in some of the slides. Um, you know, once you get into June, there are things like cover sprays. But then it's uh, then you get into some of the more fun things like harvesting and and especially if you plan your orchard outright, plan your your fruit garden outright, you can have fruit from the beginning of June all the way until the end of October. Um, and some of this is very specific to some of the plants that we offer with Kansas City Community Gardens. So a little plug for, for us, uh, we are a membership organization and we do have a fruit tree sales every basically late winter. It's a bare root fruit tree sale. 
if you become a member, you can pre-order some of these fruit plants. Um, and, and then we also sell bare root berries, uh, blackberries and raspberries and strawberries. So as we get into July and August, uh, you know, we have some early apples in July. Uh, pristine, probably one of the best crisp apples for our region in July. Um, it's not some of these other really soft apple varieties, but it starts ripening then. Um, and there's another document that will be shared later on this week. It'll go out in, in, in an email. Uh, it's a PDF of the fruit plants for the Kansas City area. Uh, with uh, basically the criteria is disease resistance and adapted to our region. Uh, so that's, uh, be looking for that a little bit later on because it lists, you know, it doesn't list 20 varieties of apples. It lists six varieties of apples that do well around here. Hardly any of these are going to be apples that you see in the grocery store. Most of those apples that grow, uh, that you see in the grocery store, they don't grow well around here. Honeycrisp, you can always find at a hardware store. You can find at a garden center. It's going to yellow. The leaves are going to get mottled and its growth is going to be stunted. Uh, it, yes, you can grow it here, but you have to grow it on life support. Uh, so there are, a number of varieties like Liberty, like Sundance, like Enterprise, uh, like Pristine, like Williams Pride. These are all disease resistant varieties that have been bred by universities over the past 30 to 40 years. And basically to have good resistance to apple scab, good resistance to fire blight, good resistance to cedar apple rust, and good resistance to powdery mildew. Powdery mildew, yeah, we face problems with, but those, those former three, scab, fire blight, and cedar apple rust, definitely we have big issues with, and that can ruin the fruit, or it can ruin the, the foliage to the point where you do not get good fruit off of the tree. So um, be looking for that list uh, later on. Like I say, it has a lot of great varieties for your home orchard. And so this is just kind of more as, as uh, but then we get into November and November is actually kind of another one of these important times. Sure, you've, you've, you've done all your harvesting, uh, but November, you, you more or less are putting your orchard to bed. Uh, you're, you're, you're mulching the leaves beneath the tree. You're spraying a, uh, a nitrogen, maybe in the form of liquid fish on the ground to help break down fungus, to help break down leaves. Uh, so the cycle of, of fungus does not uh, repeat itself the next year. Uh, you may end up spraying a fungicide on your peach to, pre to prevent peach leaf curl, uh, things like that. Or in some cases, you're aerating. You're aerating your soil because we know most of our soil is not this really nice buttery, loamy stuff. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of clay and we need to aerate so we get some more organic matter into that soil. So we have better drainage in the soil. So we have oxygen in the soil because uh, clay is a definite problem that we all face around here. Okay, so let's get into one of the really, I think, elemental pieces that most people do not do with their trees, and that is pruning their trees. Um, you'll, you'll hear different philosophies about trees and what you're supposed to do after you plant them or at the time of planting. Uh, some people suggest, oh, never prune your fruit tree. It will just grow the way it is supposed to grow and you will get an abundance of fruit. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, you might get some fruit. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, depending on where the tree is sited, the tree, uh, the tree can grow any which number of ways. Um, so why do we prune these trees? One is for strong tree structure. These are going to be laden with weight, with the weight of fruit. So you want 
branch angles that are connected. You don't want branch angles that are tight. You want to make sure that the tree can support that fruit weight. You also want intense, you want to increase light intensity in the canopy. Uh, the reason there is what drives fruit bud formation, sunlight. What also helps with ripening, sunlight. Uh, increased airflow in the canopy is also very important. What helps mitigate fungus, airflow. So, so another reason to prune. Of course, there's removing broken limbs, bad angles, kind of talked about that, diseased limbs. Um, controlling tree size, that's also very important. How many of us have seen a 25 foot tall pear tree and you can't get to those fruits that are in the top 13 feet of that tree? Um, so now is actually a really good time to be pruning to control the size of your pears and your apple trees. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And fruit trees grow fast. Uh, so on some of these trees, now first year, you probably won't see that flush of growth. Second and third year, you can get four to eight feet of growth on some of these trees. All of a sudden, you have eight feet of growth in the wrong place on that tree. That's trouble. So you need to be able to and willing to. And sometimes it's the willingness to actually cut the wood. And that we work with a lot of groups. And it's like, psychologically, it's tough for people to want to cut something off. Um, so uh, it's all part of the education that we, that we offer. So when you get new trees in, and this, this sort of assumes a, a bare root tree, a whip tree, if you will, that you get in. A whip is basically something that has been grafted the year before and it has no branches on it, um, it is a stick. So when you get your tree like this, you automatically need to head that whip off. What that does is it helps promote branching outward and branching where you want branching. Oftentimes I like to say it's always good to have branching start at about three feet. Now, as the tree gets much older, you may end up raising the tree up to maybe four or five feet, but starting out at three feet is a good goal. And then where you head, you will get a new shoot that will take over as the central leader. And this is something you do this the first year in the dormant season, you do this the second year in the dormant season, you do it the third year in the dormant season, all of a sudden you have a nice well-branched tree. So that's just kind of, you know, the, the you know, first three years, very easy. Although the tree is going to react in different ways and you will have to make some thinning cuts in there. So this is kind of another example of that. Uh, so you see kind of the, the sort of before and after on the central lead training. And sure, you're going to get more branching. You're going to get branching where every bud is along that trunk you then have to start removing for spacing. And you basically want these branches to come out sort of uh, uh, at equal distance around the tree and going up the tree. So you wanna make sure that on the north side, you have good branch coverage. On the west side, you have good branch coverage, et cetera, et cetera. So well-rounded, and, and sort of these scaffold-like limbs. Um, and when I say scaffold, I'm talking about these collections of limbs that sort of radiate up the tree. Um, and that, that last point there, consider the two to three feet uh, between scaffolds, That's, that can be kind of a goal. Uh, if you look at, at high production, uh, apple orchards, they actually do these things at about 18 inches and they do it along a trellis line. For the homeowner, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, ultimately, what you want is you just want good distance between all of those branches. You don't want the same branch competing for space. Peaches look a little bit different. Peaches are pruned entirely different. And there are a number of reasons for that. Peaches are one of the fastest growing fruit trees out there. 
The other thing that peaches do very differently than most of our other traditional fruit trees is they only bear fruit on the second year. So you have your first year, that second year they put on the flowers. Those flower buds are done after they have put on those fruits. Whereas apricots, cherries, all of your foam fruits, those flower buds will last for four, five, 10 years in some cases. Peaches, they're kind of one and done. Uh, so you end up doing a lot more pruning on your peaches. But here, this is just trying to establish a new peach with this slide. And peaches, you don't do this central leader approach. You do more of, of an open base approach. <clears throat> and this, this open base, well, one, it allows definitely for more sunlight and more airflow. It also allows for more of these little fruiting branches that come on annually to, so you're, you're opening it up and allowing for these 18 inch branches that are lined with flower buds to come up into the middle and produce peaches. And then those get cut back and you end up cutting back the six feet of growth that emerged out of nowhere. Um, so you're constantly opening up these peaches and it's not unusual to take a good 30 to 50% out of a peach tree every year. So when you plant peaches, just beware. You, you've, got a, you've got a job ahead of you, but it's a tasty job. So this is actually just kind of a before and after. Um, this was done over uh, uh, with Wyandotte County Extension. We were working in an orchard over in the Turner neighborhood. And um, you'll, you'll see, and by the way, when you do pruning demonstrations in the winter, if you're trying to get photos, always have a whiteboard or something behind you because it's a collection of sticks. It's hard to see. Um, so, so here you'll see the before picture. Okay, hey, that tree looks fine. What's wrong with that tree? Well, actually, yeah, it's too thick. There's too much growth in the middle. You have all of these things that are going straight up in the middle. It's almost like a, it's, it's almost like a central leader. This would, this would actually make a better cherry tree than a peach tree. So notice the, the big, that big chunk taken out that was a central leader. And now notice everything that's going outward. And that's what you want with peaches to start out with. As a peach tree gets older, you end up going back in a little bit on it because you have too much fruit weight. But for when you're trying to get peaches established, because I believe this was maybe third year on this tree. So this started out as one of those whips like, like that. And second year, I don't think it got really pruned. Um, so third year we had a workshop, it's like, oh, it needs to be like this. And, and then, uh, thusly they started getting really nice peaches out of that, but you have to keep on top of these. So this speaks to kind of the different structural pruning that, uh, all of these, uh, well, some of these fruit trees, uh, need to be pruned like. So pear and apple are, are typically a central leader or modified central leader approach. Uh, apple, cherry, and plum are more of, an, uh, more of a modified central leader, but you're opening up a little bit. You're not opening up like an open base of a peach tree. And then there are things like espalier. Uh, you know, that's, those look really nice. Uh, don't try to espalier a peach tree. Uh, it doesn't work too well uh, just because you have too much fast growth. And cherry trees can be kind of tough to espalier too. Pears and apples are probably one of the easier ones to espalier. But you do have to prune a lot more during the growing season to keep a lot of growth in check. So another part about uh, pruning is, is actually forming branch angles. And some of this you can do early on when the wood is very pliable, that first, sometimes second year wood on these trees. You could use things like clothespins. Uh, I didn't bring any limb spreaders with me. You'll probably see a photo of some limb spreaders. 
these are basically, uh, you can make limb spreaders out of lath. Uh, just get, go to the hardware store, get some wooden lath and create some little V notches. And you stick this between the trunk and a branch to increase the branch angle. And this only works when the wood is very young and pliable before the branch angle really gets set. But this is very important when you're trying to form that structure on your tree. Because naturally some of these things grow and they put up a 15 degree angle and then that 15 degree angle gets set. Three years later, the branch breaks out because it's loaded with fruit and it has a poor connection. So this is very important for the, uh, the first few years of your tree's life. Um, so this just speaks to kind of the, the pruning for branch strength and forming for branch strength. Uh, so with a lot of these trees, we're looking for kind of a 45 to 60 degree angle. And this goes for shade trees. This goes, this, this kind of across the board. Um, fruit trees, just because they grow quickly uh, and have a fruit load, it's, it's also especially important. So you can see the cross section of the strong branch connection. You can see the cross section of the weak branch connection. Basically everything under, and I believe it's 17 degrees. 17, 17 degrees is kind of that sort of breaking point, or it's that point where you have dead tissue uh, in there in the branch angle. And where you have dead tissue, that's a weakness and that will break. So here we are kind of back to, uh, back to the same pruning day a number of years ago. Uh, this just happens to be with a European pear. European and Asian pears, but probably European worse. Uh, but a pear is a pear is a pear. They naturally grow these very tight branch angles. And that's what's going on in the before picture. Not only is it very tight branch angles, but it is a lot of shoots going straight up. There is no such thing as a central leader with that tree right now. It's uh, sort of a uh, uh, synquadominant or quadradominant central leader situation. You have that many, that many tops that are going for the saw. Um, so we ended up cutting a lot of that out and you can actually barely see there's a, a wooden limb spreader uh, uh, in, in the photo there. Um, and so we've, we've pruned out a lot of the stuff that's competing with the central leader. We've spaced some of these limbs and we've actually made some cuts to the outside facing bud, a directionally pruned cut. So you have your central leader, you have a branch, you prune to a bud that's facing outward, outward as opposed to a bud that's facing inward. And that's very important, not only with fruit trees, but also your shade trees as well. It helps open up the canopy of the tree. The whole lesson here is prune your trees before they get to this point. Uh, this, uh, uh, there are a bunch of pear trees put in and uh, in uh, this, a couple empty lots over kind of in, in Midtown. And uh, these were just left. They got planted, yeah, they got watered early on, nothing got pruned. So this is what pear trees will turn into if they don't get pruned. And the deal here is not only do you have a lot of really tight branch angles, but you also have a lot of excessive growth, a lot of water sprouty growth, Water sprout is that, that, that one year's worth of growth that goes straight up into the canopy. You have branches that are twisted around one another. This thing is just a total mess. Um, so get to your trees before they, they, they get to this. And another thing, and this is common if people don't know fruit trees, um, most, I would say 90, Five percent of fruit trees are grafted. Uh, the ones that aren't grafted, somebody has grown from seed. Uh, or in the case of a fig, for example, they've grown from a cutting. But sort of your traditional palm 
and uh, stone fruits, they are grafted onto a rootstock. Well, that rootstock is not the same as the scion, as the variety. And so oftentimes, and this is just a reaction that certain rootstocks will have. They, some rootstocks have more of a propensity to send up suckers, but those need to be dealt with. I've come across uh, trees where the rootstock has a caliper of the actual scion variety, and it's horrible. It, it, the rootstock has sucked all of the sunlight, all of the energy away. So some of this is just, you know, good garden etiquette, if you will. Um, but, but you need to know that these are grafted and the rootstock does not produce good fruit. Um, and then the use of limb spreaders, talked about those earlier. You see the little red things up in the tree. Uh, those, are, those are limb spreaders. Um, what I, I, so you could go on Amazon, look these up. They're called twig ease, uh, T W I G E E Z E, uh, and you could buy packets of twig ease limb spreaders. Uh, so they they have a little barb uh, right in the center that actually you do poke into the wood, uh, just creates a small wound. It's all right, and you set it in there, and it'll hold. With these limb spreaders, you keep them in for basically a growing season. You'll come back and check. You'll pull it out, see if the branch angle is set. If the branch doesn't move back, then the branch angle is set. You can move that limb spreader on to another limb around the tree. But this is a, a European pear tree. Once again, we're trying to sort of correct the fact that this tree was just wanting to send all of its energy straight up. And so, We've pruned the outside buds and we've inserted limb spreaders where we can. Once again, limb spreaders, you know, they, they only really are helpful for those first, you know, two to three years of growth. After that, uh, the, the angle has been set. It's hard to actually set limb spreaders in without breaking the branch. Uh, also, you see the ladder there. Uh, that's the type of ladder I'm talking about, uh, the tripod ladder. Uh, like I say, they're really great. Okay, so a little bit about summer pruning, uh, which we've been in the heat of right now. Uh, so uh, this is uh, some of what we focus on during summer pruning. It's, and it's mainly apples, pears, and Asian pears that we work on. We really don't deal with the stone fruit so much in the summer. Uh, we have some pests like the lesser peach tree borer that actually sniffs out wounds on 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 things in the peach uh, or in the in the stone fruit family. Um, so we just don't want to open up wounds on these crops this time of year. But um, we're focused on water sprouts and we're focused on a lot of excessive growth. That excessive one year growth that can happen. Uh, especially with European pears, some on Asian pears, some on apples. But just, just realize, especially if you have an older European pear, now is the time to prune it. Don't make 50 to 100 cuts on a European pear in the wintertime. You will have so much excessive growth uh, when you start to manage that tree again during next year's growing season. Forgive me if you addressed this earlier in the talk because I wasn't here, but those of us with ornamental apples, should we be thinking about the same you know, crab apples? That yeah, apples so apples crab are. apples, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't focus the same. Uh, crab apples being more ornamental, you're not going for the fruit on them. Uh, they're still, I mean, some of the, the same general pruning principles do apply. Um, so I wanna keep going here. Uh, blackberries are another thing that we prune in the summer. And uh, most of you, if you grow blackberries, you know the way they grow. They are basically perennial plants, but they have biennial canes. Meaning the canes that are emerging this year will fruit next year. The canes that have fruited this year, they're done. Uh, unless you have primocane. And, and that's a different story. We're not talking about primocane blackberries. We're, we're talking about 
more of the traditional flora cane blackberries. Um, so we do a lot of blackberry management this time of year. We set up clothesline trellises for our blackberries. It's just the best way to get high production. And uh, got a, so this is blackberries during the dormant season, kind of a before and after. And then this is kind of the sort of management document on how we deal with our blackberries. And we do this for not only ease of maintenance, but also uh, to maximize production. So throughout the summer, we have these new canes that are emerging. We tie them up to a trellis line that's about four and a half feet high. Once it's tied to a line, we tip it. That tipping promotes branching. That branching will then be next year's fruit. However, because we're still very much in the active growing season, sometimes we have to tip back those laterals that have sent out eight feet of growth, for example. So blackberry management is, it takes uh, some real time, but it's a real reward the next year. Um, in regards to primocane blackberries, I still don't think we have great varieties around here and our climate doesn't work as well for some of the primocanes compared to the floricane varieties. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Um, so here is the simplified pruning schedule, uh, late January to March, prune your trees. Um, blackberries, if you haven't removed last year's fruited canes, which you should have already done by now, uh, unless you have some of the late varieties like Chester, for example, that is probably still fruiting. Um, uh, but then you cut back uh, some of your lateral growth, the, the stuff that's going to have the fruit that may be four to eight feet long. You cut that back to 12 to 15 inches. The reason there is now you have all these lateral spurs that are right here on your trellis line. They're not down there on the ground. They're not in the middle of the patch somewhere. It's easy picking. It's not a hunt and peck kind of thing. Um, Raspberries, and this, this goes for uh, the uh, primocane raspberries. That's kind of uh, what's built into our DNA because they're easy maintenance. Uh, you would just mow down to the, down to the crown. Uh, set your mower on high and just right over it. Um, figs, you know, that's, that's I mean, yeah. Uh, and then midsummer, uh, blackberries. Uh, and apples and pears. Those are the, the main things that you would focus on. Okay, so let's get into some of these other tasks that you're doing. Notice I spent a long time on pruning, but pruning is very important. Uh, so dormant oil spray, kind of men mentioned that. Oh, removing and pinching off blossoms. Oh, why would you want to do that? These are fruit trees that are going to provide fruit for you. Well, during the first two years, what does a fruit tie up on a tree? It ties up nutrients, it ties up water. And in some cases, you might have 50 fruits on a tree that is this tall and has a caliper that is no thicker than your finger. You do not want 50 fruits on a tree that looks like that. What will happen is the tree will lean over, it'll look like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, and it will suffer for the rest of its life. So the first, uh, first couple of years, you're definitely pinching those blossoms off. And if you miss the blossoms, well, pinch the fruits off. But psychologically, I think it's a little bit easier to pinch the blossoms than the fruits. Because once you see that fruit, you're gonna be like, I want to eat that fruit. Um, so you're doing the tree training, you're doing the blackberry uh, tipping and training. You're doing summer pruning, of course, and then you're doing some mulching. And mulching is something that I think just needs to be done every year. Uh, mulch breaks down, especially the kind of mulch you should be using. Uh, you should just be using some good hardwood chips, uh, not necessarily dyed hardwood mulch, but just, just hardwood chips. Coniferous chips sometimes don't actually provide the same amount of, uh, well, that one, they don't break down. And by not breaking down, they don't help build the soil. 
So um, if you have a chance to just get regular wood chips, that's the best. So as we get uh, further down the road, you know, we're, we're three plus years on, um, then there's a little bit more that we have to start thinking about and things take a little bit more time because the trees are larger. Um, so dormant oil spray, definitely. That's something that I think everybody needs to do. There are things like Paracilla and leaf pearl midge that, you know, they, Paracilla can actually cause a lot of damage. Leaf pearl midge, uh, it can cause a lot of damage on new growth. You know, it's things like that that aren't your normal fruit pests that you don't think about, but it's something that a, a good dormant oil can help smother. Um, so then uh, petal fall spray. Oh, that's a new thing. Why, why am I doing this? Well, you're doing this because after the blossoms have dropped on your fruit trees and those little fruitlets are getting formed, that's right when the oriental fruit moth, right when the codling moth knows to lay their eggs. And where, where are they going to lay their eggs? They're going to lay them close to where the fruit is. They're going to lay them on those little fruitlets or the little leaves right near those little fruitlets. So now is the time to be applying some sort of petal fall spray. Oftentimes this looks like, uh, this can look like neem oil or it can look like BT. Both of these are organic insecticides that can be used for this. You never do this during flowering because well, if you did it during flowering, well, pollinators could be affected. So you have to be very careful about uh, spray timing. We'll get into this a little bit more. Uh, there's fruit thinning. You know, that's another thing. And then some of the rest of this is um, we've, we've talked about. So let's talk about blossom and fruit pinching. So, you know, it's as simple as that. It's thumb and forefinger. Uh, with, with apples and, and pears, you have these clusters of anywhere to five to seven blossoms. You can just, just right off. Very easy on young fruit trees. Now, as you get into older fruit trees, you know, you, you, you have fruits that are set on, then you wanna start thinning fruits. Now, why do you thin fruits? Well, if you have five to seven fruits that actually start forming in that one cluster, they're not going to be big fruits, one, when they fully mature, but everywhere where these fruits are touching, this becomes a weak point, this becomes a soft spot, this becomes a spot that an oriental fruit moth, that a codling moth could be setting up camp to drill into the fruit. So it's kind of this little homey spot for them. Um, and, and honestly, you get, you get small fruits if you don't thin your fruit. So, you know, it's nicer to have sort of a, a fruit that's a third of a pound versus a, a fruit that is, you know, a tenth of a pound, um, especially when it comes to peaches too. So this is kind of a little, a little fruit thinning here. This is actually on an espalier apple that we have. Um, so notice that uh, before thinning, we had uh, three to five fruits per cluster on this. And this was, this photo was taken sometime late May. So really your fruit thinning happens from, you know, late April. And I mean, honestly, you could still be thinning some fruits on some of your late ripening varieties. Um, but really, May, late April all the way to mid-June is kind of a good time frame to be thinning fruit. If you have early ripening things that are going to be mid-June, early July, you need to get out there and thin your fruits a lot early though. So anyhow, there's before thinning and there's after thinning. And notice we have one per cluster down there. Uh, so when you thin the fruits out, you're thinning the inferior fruits. You're pulling the inferior fruits off. They're either small, or in some cases, they already have a, a little bit of insect damage, or they haven't been pollinated correctly. I don't know how many times you've, you've seen a fruit that it's, it's kind of malformed very early on. It just didn't get full pollination. Here's another example of why to thin fruits. and, and um, 
So these were a couple Asian pears and, and honest, they were on the tree that way. It's too bad we didn't get the photo of them on the tree that way. But uh, so these are Asian pears sitting side by side. Um, and you look, see where they were side by side. There you see that weak spot. So, and Asian pears are especially susceptible to this. So if you've gone to the supermarket, you've seen they're wrapped in those little styrofoam cozies. Um, if so they don't bruise. And, uh, but Asian pears on the tree, they're clanking around like this and that. So it's a reason to, to make sure you thin them out so they don't touch. Asian pears are, are wonderful. We love them a lot. And it's a heavy fruit year for them, which is great. However, it also means that you really need to get out and thin them. And then there's peaches. And peaches are a little bit different because they, they normally it's one blossom. It's not a cluster of blossoms. Sometimes you might have two blossoms side by side. Uh, so these you thin a little bit differently and you thin going down the stem. And it's sort of a little bit of a rule of thumb, uh, but it's a you know it's about a, a a six to eight inches between each stem going down the branch. Sometimes you can get away if the peaches alternate down the branch. You can have them closer, but peaches are also very prone to splitting out. It even happens to us. We had a had a tree that split out that we just didn't prune enough and. It was a, a heavy peach year for that particular one, and so it split out on us. All right, a little bit about ring mulching. It's, uh, I mean, we're all gardeners. We know about mulching. Um, but uh, mulch is can really, really save a tree. We have a lot of our trees in kind of these public areas, uh, school grounds, parks, uh, park-like settings. Uh, the the, uh, the mow crew uh, is not the same that takes care of the trees oftentimes. And so uh, the mulch ring not only helps announce to the mow crew that there's something here to mow around, uh, which is important, um, but also that mulch helps moderate temperatures in the summertime, moderate temperatures in the wintertime, keeps that moisture in the ground in the summertime and in the wintertime. Now, oftentimes our winters are drier here than our summers can be. Although for us in Kansas City, it's been kind of droughty. You guys haven't been so bad here. Um, so, uh, but, but some other things, uh, it helps alleviate compaction. So those mowers that would be driving right up next to the trunk, uh, if they do drive up next to the trunk, well, they're driving on wood chips. So at least there's a little bit of a sponge that's helping protect the roots there. And the nice thing about the, 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 the non-coniferous hardwood mulch is it does decompose, it does break down, it means you have to apply it more often, but it helps build that soil. All right, so here's kind of the, the, fun, the fun part here. And what time do we have? Okay, we're plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know we'll have a few questions too. Um, all right, as I mentioned earlier, you know, with the, the variety list that, that we have, um, we try to make sure that uh, a lot of these trees have good resistance and or immunity to some of these diseases and funguses uh, that are present that we know we have. And so this is just a list, this is a, short list of, of some of the, the diseases that these common fruit crops get. So apple scab is one, and apple scab can be present not only on the foliage, but on the branches. And when it gets onto the fruit, it's almost game over. Then you have this big kind of oozing lesion that ends up spreading to all of the other fruits. So having that scab immunity is really important. And a lot of that scab immunity has actually come from a crab apple, Malus floribunda. And that, that crab apple 
uh, immunity has been bred into a number of these varieties of apples. So there's the, uh, uh, the PRI apples. And this is something you could go to. They have a great old website about all of the apples that they've bred. Um, Mo, they've all been bred to have either immunity and or good resistance to apple scab. Some of these other things like cedar apple rust, that's sort of a, a, a byproduct of the, of the breeding. Um, but having, having good immunity and or resistance to cedar apple rust, I will tell you is very important in this region. There are some years where those, the apple trees, they set on a few leaves and when each one of those leaves gets colonized by cedar apple rust, that really takes a lot of energy out of that tree. And you do that year in and year out. You may have an apple tree that's five, 10 years old and it's only grown six feet maybe, if even. Uh, it can really, really zap the energy out of the tree. Fire blight is, more insidious because fire blight will get in and it will kill the entire tree. And so having good resistance to fire blight is really important. I went and visited a tree yesterday and it was, it was unfortunate. It was uh, a good looking tree, but it got fire blight in the rootstock. It actually got it through, uh, through a rootstock sucker. So fire blight can be transmitted a few different ways. It can be transmitted through flower blossoms and that's transmitted through pollinization. So you could have any number of pollinators that will bring fire blight from one tree to another tree. All the darn calorie pears that are out here. Oh, by the way, cut them down out there in the garden. Um, <laughs> uh, so it serves as an inoculum of fire blight actually. Uh, calorie pears oftentimes don't exhibit the symptoms of fire blight, but they can carry fire blight. Just one more reason to hate. One more reason. I, you know, we've, we've got yeah, I've got a got a list there, long list going. Um, but another thing about fire blight is if even when the trees aren't flowering, they can also get fire blight. It can be spread through the air. So if you get a hail damage on something that has fire blight, you open up wounds to something that doesn't have fire blight, it can get transmitted. So, and fire blight gets transmitted during these, you know, sort of this degree window also. So, it, and it can kill a tree. Some trees are good at uh, segmenting fire blight off, but just beware. Powdery mildew, I'm not too concerned about that. That's something where we see a little bit of it. We have good fungicides that can help, help battle that. So the same deal with European pears and Asian pears is, is we're looking at, at something that uh, has good resistance to fire blight which can be a lot harder with Asian pears, actually. Um, and Asian pears, when they're young, uh, younger are going to be more susceptible to fire blight. Um, but uh, the variety list that you guys will be getting uh, has, a, has a good list of, of a lot of those pears. And then uh, with, with peaches, uh, peach leaf curl is definitely a big problem. There's not really, good resistance built into peaches against peach leaf curl. And we get peach leaf curl almost year in and year out. There are some varieties like Red Haven that actually can get peach leaf curl, put on a good fruit crop. The fruit crop ripens just fine. They just deal with it. Other varieties like Intrepid, not so good at that. Um, but uh, peach leaf curl, you can treat for that, and you just have to know when to spray. Uh, things like bacterial spot can be more of an issue because bacterial spot not only manifests itself in the fruit, but then it can manifest itself in the foliage, and you could end up getting cankers that build up. <clears throat> now, brown rot, that's something that all, all of your stone fruits uh, could end up getting. Uh, there's no really good resistance to brown rot, but early ripening varieties actually can avoid brown rot. So most of the time your cherries are not going to get brown rot. 
or your early ripening peaches will not get brown rot. And then you see with with cherries, uh, some of the some of the same uh, the same diseases apply to peaches. So with that, oh, wrong way. So that was just an overview. Here's an overview of the fruit pests. And the way I have this segmented out is you kind of have your first year pest, your foliar pests, if you will. And the next slide is going to be your fruit pests. Uh, notice, however, that oriental moth, oriental fruit moth, it goes both ways. It's a, both a foliar and a fruit pest. And oftentimes the way we know we have oriental fruit moth in our orchard is we look at the tips of our peach tree leaves and it's what's called a tip strike. There's the little larva that's hanging out uh, inside the pith of the end of the branch. Basically the, the mama lays the egg uh, right on this tip of the stem, the egg hatches, the little caterpillar starts worming its way around inside the stem. Then it will drop out, pupate, and then another generation is born. That next generation ends up laying its eggs on the fruit, and then the cycle repeats. Oriental fruit moth has five to seven generations of moths each year in our area. So it's kind of ugly. It's, it's not. Uh, um, Aphids, who knows how many generations they have. They, they just, you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even think the, 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 the fruit tree entomologists know how many generations they have. Um, aphids are more of a problem on new growth on apples. Most of the time what I tell people with aphids is just squish them off. Oftentimes where you find aphids, you'll also find uh, uh, ladybugs or lacewing larvae and they're already eating on the aphids by the time you see the aphid damage. Things like peach tree borer, these aren't foliar pests, no, but these are tree pests. And peach tree borer, greater peach tree borer is the number one reason peach trees don't live very long around here. This is a, it's a moth that looks like a wasp. Uh, that lays its eggs right near the base of the tree. These eggs hatch. The, the larva will just circle around and circle around. And before you know it, the tree is girdled. Oftentimes you see it this time of year too. You'll, you'll see uh, what a seemingly healthy looking peach, all of a sudden it will have these dried out crispy leaves just hanging from the tree. That is a sign that the peach tree borers have gotten to your tree. Lots of miscellaneous loopers out there. Um, you know, that's, uh, some are actually good, some are bad. Most of the ones that you would find on your apple trees are probably bad, but there are some, some native uh, Lepidoptera that they do host on apple trees. Cecropia, for example, a beautiful big native moth. Uh, uh, well host on apple trees. And there are things like spider mites, bagworms. Bagworms coupled with Japanese beetles will defoliate an apple tree. Um, and bagworms, you, you oftentimes think of these on eastern red cedar or the, just the ornamental junipers that have planted in the landscape. Well, their next favorite food is apple. So, uh, and the way bagworms uh, work is, is when they're very young, they balloon from, from where they've, they've hatched out. So they'll set that little web, they'll balloon over to their next food plant. And if that food plant's an apple tree, they're set up. Um, you couple that with Japanese beetle damage and that will set back a year, if not two years of growth on apple trees. So here are some of our, our fruit pests. <clears throat> and uh, so called that because they do damage fruit. Coddling moth probably uh, is, is the biggest one for ruining our apple party. Uh, you know, Asian and European pear, coddling moth doesn't get into so much, which is kind of amazing. They are just built to get into apples and they, they love it. Coddling moth can have up to two generations a year. 
Um, but if you get codling moth in your orchard, you could almost guarantee it's going to ruin uh, ruin all of the apples or most of the apples on your trees. Uh, another thing that I, I don't have here is apple maggot. Uh, that's another one that's uh, also known as apple fruit fly. Yeah, that can can also ruin some of your early season apples. There's plum cucurlio. Uh, plum cucurlio is actually one of the, the very conscious reasons that early on in our program we did not offer plum trees. Um, because uh, as the name suggests, that's what they go for first. Uh, plum cucurlio will get into apple fruits. However, most of the time with apples, the apple grows so tight that the egg never hatches out. So the little cucurlio, which is a weevil, uh, will lay the egg and you see the, that's where it's ovoposited, where it's laid its egg on the fruit kind of looks like a little ghost or a 10 gallon hat or something like that. Um, but that apple texture is so tight that the egg never hatches. And uh, little did you know, you might be eating uh, bug eggs. <laughs> we eat a lot of things, you know, it's just, uh, get over it. Uh, <laughs> um, there's oriental fruit moth again, I already talked about that. Brown marmorated stink bug and actually some of the other stink bugs uh, are very problematic around here. The green stink bug, uh, if you get infestations of green stink bug, they can, they can really dent in uh, Asian pear and European pear. Basically, they have this little sucking mouth part that releases a toxin that ends up uh, either pitting and or making indentions on the fruit, depending on the time that they do that. There's another relative called the leaf-footed bug that also is a problem. And the leaf-footed bug kind of looks a little bit like the brown marmorated stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bug, I wanna to bring to your attention because we're kind of right on the Western edge of, of brown marmorated stink bugs territory. And it has caused a big problem in a lot of, a lot of the orchards back East. Uh, where they, they create these, these little indentions in the fruit and basically make the fruit totally unmarketable. It's still usable. You can cut all that out, but it makes it unmarketable. And then there's giant green June beetle. And uh, this is not Japanese beetle, but this is a big green scarab that has a mouth part that makes a little indention. And then once it gets into that fruit, gets the sugars, all of a sudden, before you know it, you have five or six of these inside the cavity of the fruit just working away at it. Um, and this is just a short list. So, um, so with that, we also need to know about you know the, the biology and the life cycle. And uh, yeah, this is going to be on all of you to learn some of this too. And we do have some resources to help. Um, but you need to know, you know, what is the life cycle in, in the winter time? Where does this pest go? Is it, is it, a, is it pupating uh, under the bark in some bark crevices somewhere? Is it, is it in the leaf litter? Is it in the mulch? Um, so that will tell you, okay, then I, I can deal with this in some way. Hey, I've got chickens. I'm going to let my chickens out in February and March to scratch up the mulch and peck around the trees and pull out any of these larvae that are living in the mulch. Oh, if it's if it's pupating in the bark, well, maybe I need to spray a little bit more in these bark crevices and get stuff like that. So knowing how most of these pests uh, operate, knowing their life cycle is really important. And as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> with a lot of these well, with two of the fruit pests in particular, the oriental fruit moth and codling moth, a lot of their first generation corresponds to when those blossoms drop off, to when those little fruitlets are formed. And uh, herein lies sort of a, you know, this is, this is for apples. This is apple bud development right here. But this also, can be kind of helpful for dictating a bit of a spray calendar. And um, 
So if you think of number one there in, in the top, uh, the top left hand corner, uh, that's when you'd be spraying a dormant oil when those buds are still really tight. Um, and then we get into you know, some of these other stages. Now there's a whole different sort of school of, of, uh, of pest management called holistic orcharding that Michael Phillips, uh, a grower in New York has developed or New Hampshire, I guess. Um, and it relies on a lot of organic compounds like liquid fish and neem oil and probiotics. And his spray schedule is really pretty intense. This is kind of more homeowner friendly, a little bit more user friendly. Um, so, you know, that number four down there, when you're, uh, when you're past green tip to, to like half inch green, you know, that can be a time to apply something like a fungicide if let's say you have cedar apple rust as a problem. Um, and then we have, you know, definitely don't spray. Um, although commercial orchardists, yes, they do spray fungicides uh, when things are in full flower. You know, that's one of those things where they're, they're trying to protect a crop oftentimes from fire blight things like that. Uh, but that's a big investment that they're also trying to protect. So we're, we're homeowners. I think, you know, we can be kind of responsible on individual tree basis. Um, but really, it's that kind of from petal fall to uh, the fruit set time, that's sort of the really important time for that BT for the, the, the fruit caterpillars. And then, you know, there, there, there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of stuff that, that you, can, you can buy as a homeowner over the counter. Um, there's a lot more that's restricted use for ag that, that we will never really have access to unless you have a pesticide license. Um, but uh, so there are a lot of products out there. You know, our philosophy is, is try to do it biologically and try to do it organically. Um, however, <laughs> that sometimes doesn't cut it uh, when, you're, when you're growing fruit trees, but there are a lot of products like stenosids and uh, pyrethrin and BT that are actually labeled for organic use and are OMRI certified. Um, and there are hort oils that are OMRI certified. Uh, copper and sulfur fungicides are safe for organic use. It just depends on the formulation. Uh, so there is a lot out there, uh, and you can grow these things organically. If you're trying to grow them certified organically, well, you have to work with a certifier to do that. But most of us are homeowners. For, um, so, uh, but yeah, there is a lot out there. Uh, and these are just some of the products. Now, some of the pyrethroids are not organic, but some of the just pyrethrin is. So, so knowing what these are uh, and how they're formulated is important too. Now, for those of you who don't want to spray, there are barrier controls. And so um, you can actually go and bag your individual fruits when they're about dime size. How many people have done that? Uh, it's painful. It's, uh, you're bagging 200 fruits and you know, you can't just do this in 10 seconds. It's, it takes a little bit longer than that. Also, you have to thin your fruits out first. Um, so you can get these little nylon footies. Uh, that works. You can actually use Ziploc bags. It's a waste of plastic. Um, but you have to cut a notch in the top for the stem. And you also have to cut a notch down in the corner of the bag to let out some of the moisture. And that doesn't work for peaches. That will not work for peaches or plums. That's a good way to get brown rot if you, if you want to get brown rot started. Um, and then there are some folks that believe in netting the entire tree. And there, there's a group out of Seattle that's doing this. Now, it takes five or six people to put a net on the tree. Uh, and you have to put this on very early. It also assumes that you don't have any pests that are overwintering in the tree too. So there's, 
you still have to you would still have to do some spraying prior to netting. Um, but it does help with some of their pest pressure, but it's just very time and labor intensive. And you're probably going to be breaking some branches in the process of netting the tree. But this stuff is out there and it all depends on your time and a little bit of your philosophy. Now there are some other things that you can do. Uh, planting more flowers, more native wildflowers, things that have big flower heads that have nectaries. These will actually attract a lot of beneficial predator insects. And these beneficial predator insects can help with caterpillar control in the orchard, uh, can help with curlio control in the orchard. So have some of these kind of set off to the side of your orchard. We're all gardeners, we like flowers. This is a good reason to plant some native wildflowers. You have a bigger orchard, maybe plant some trap crops. You know, plant uh, plant some sunflowers or some buckwheat, something that will attract stink bugs over to one corner of the property, and then torch it all when all the stink <laughs> bugs are there, or mow it down. Um, but also, just as important as is cleaning up fallen fruit. If you have enough fruit trees that they're dropping fruit pick them up, get them out of the orchard, because oftentimes what's happening is those fruits fall, the pest is just going to go through another life cycle in that fallen fruit. There's wildlife, we all face deer, uh, we face rabbits. Rabbits are, are predators of apple trees, especially when they're young. Having tree wraps around is very important. Um, also, there's sun scald when, when a lot of these fruit trees are really young in the winter time. That southwest side of the tree will heat up. That bark will crack. That opens a fissure. That never quite heals. And maybe two, three years down the road, the tree will end up dying from that bark splitting. Bird protection is somewhat controversial. I don't like bird netting. I've seen too many birds get caught. Um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, a, a better thing is to just hang shiny objects in the tree, have the owl that's there with the movable head. Uh, if you have the money, have the, have the little used car guy, uh, the wind sock thing. Um, this other stuff here, this, this uh, green plastic is uh, basically, uh, it's humming line that we have used over our blackberries and our cherry crops. Uh, a guy north of, uh, uh, well, around St. Joe, a blackberry grower, he started kind of touting this and using it in his blackberry farm. Basically, you string it tight and it emits both a low and a high frequency sound. And the birds, initially, the birds don't like it. And it's always initially. I mean, birds get used to things. But it will keep the birds away from your crop while your crop is ripening. And humming line could be somewhat difficult to find. You could do a quick Google search on it. So. And it's, it's like an audio cassette, but a little bit thicker consistency so you can pull it tight. And lastly, here are just some resources. Um, stuff, that, uh, stuff that I use, that we use at uh, the Giving Grove and uh, uh, the Kansas City Community Gardens for uh, kind of guide us uh, not only uh, some of these companies where Arbico, you can get a lot of organic uh, insecticides, pesticides, same with Peaceful Valley, Great, Lake, Great Lakes IPM, good for a lot of pheromone traps. Couldn't talk about pheromone traps too much, but if you have enough, uh, enough fruit trees, you may wanna consider something like pheromone traps uh, for peach tree borer, for codling moth, that can help guide your spraying decisions. Um, that's an even longer class there. Uh, so Cornell, my goodness, Cornell is just a wealth of knowledge. They do so much for uh, uh, the, the fruit tree growers. Um, and then there's NAFEX, which is kind of, you know, that's sort of a, a, a niche organization, but they're, they're dedicated to unusual fruits uh, and, and some of these uh, heritage varieties that people are growing. Um, 
Holistic Orchard, Michael Phillips, that's the book that we recommend. And this uh, basically goes through pest management and disease management in a biological way uh, around fruit trees. So I, I definitely recommend that. Uh, Lee Reich and Barbara Bowling are, are both good writers on, on fruits. Um, and then uh, with the Giving Grove, we have a, a good little pest resource uh, page. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've, it's not an app because apps are expensive, but we have a little uh, uh, diagnosis. You can take, go to the website, take your phone out there in the orchard. Oh, that hole in the fruit looks like this. And then you can read more about it. Um, and then there, there's a couple blogs that are out there. Uh, if you really want to go deeper and get into uh, actually commercial growing, uh, the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. Whew. It's it's stout, but uh, it's it's something something worth having if you if you want to delve into commercial orcharding. It's available for free. Yeah, and and it's it's as a free download, right? Still, yeah, yeah. So with that, uh, do we have questions? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Um, uh, if we have any questions in chat, we can take those. I know we got a message from someone from Seattle who says that there are lots of Ned uh, trees in Washington. Um, yeah, what <laughs> questions do we have? Uh, we have, uh, let's see, we have one, two. All right, Ms. Schlissel, will be you. Okay, Lee Wright recommended Nanking Cherry. Does that do well around here? Uh, he, he recommended it uh, maybe for his area. Uh, and there, there are some people that still kind of swear by growing it. My, my experience with Nanking is they get a lot of uh, canker on them. The fruits are not that large. So our recommendation has been for the past few years now, uh, there are the, uh, the University of Saskatchewan bush cherries, and in particular, there are two out of this series, Carmine Jewel and Juliet. Uh, so these are a much larger fruit than Man King. Uh, they're smaller than a Montmorency, which is kind of your typical pie cherry. Uh, but these, these, the shrubs will get about six to seven feet tall. You'll end up getting about 25 to 40 pounds of cherries off of these when they're mature. Uh, the juice is also a deep red. So this is not something where most of your pie cherries kind of have that clearish yellow juice. And even Nanking kind of has a, a, a has a yellowish flesh. Um, yeah, I don't think Nanking's yeah. worth it. We have a question here and then a question in chat. I'm going to end in a second. Okay. If the tree gets too tall. Is it okay just within reason just to prune off the top of it, or is that a terrible thing to do with any tree? No, no, that a uh, uh, fruit tree. Uh, so I'll, I'll caveat there. <laughs> it's funny because uh, wearing the other hat uh, as an arborist, I say don't top trees. But fruit trees, yes, it is so top it to how you can work with it. Um, if if that is eight feet. Um, you know, I think I think eight to twelve feet is kind of a good height uh, because even then you could get on a step stool maybe uh, or a small orchard ladder. Uh, but once you top it, keep in mind you have to keep topping it, and that's something. And you would want to top it this time of year, uh, that because you're basically stunting the growth this time of year. If you top it in the dormant season, you're going to have 50,000 suckers just going straight up. So if you do it now, yeah, that would be the best time. All right, and then I have uh, someone who wanted to ask a, a question um, in chat, so I just asked them to unmute. All right. Um, if they uh, will message. Uh, we'll Hi, see. Matt. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Matt, this is Chris Sundstrom. Thanks for agreeing to do this presentation. It was yeah. fabulous. And uh, the, it's about learning to grow fig trees, right? So I got them without knowing enough. And so it's sort of like more like a fig bush rather than a fig tree. And I know part, but if I would love to hear a summary from you on, on figs. 
Yeah, so uh, with figs, I mean, they naturally grow more as a shrub anyhow uh, around here. And figs being somewhat marginally hardy, uh, basically every year, if you don't provide them adequate winter protection, they will die back to the roots, but the roots will then reemerge. You'll get shoots coming up the next year. Figs, you know, that could almost be a whole other class. But basically, the fig needs as much sun, it needs full sun, and it needs very, a very hot location in order to actually produce fruit and grow well. Um, well, well, there, uh, yeah, you know, down in, down in Tulsa, down in Atlanta, they can grow figs really well. Um, and, and so there's... I don't think I have a good quick answer, but the siding is, is you just have to site it in full, full sun, a hot location. You can sometimes overwinter the cane so you get earlier fig production. And there are a number of different ways you can do that. You could bend canes over and bury them in thick mulch. And then you would unbury them in the March time frame, March, April. And then with that overwintered wood, then it will sprout earlier and then it will produce figs earlier. Uh, a lot of what the kind of older Italian immigrants have done is they end up digging up a good two thirds of the plant on one side, they'll bend it over, they'll tie it down, they'll bury it, and then they'll, they'll dig it out in that April timeframe. You could put a big, uh, insulated tarp over it too. And I've seen there are some great 15 foot tall figs in the Kansas City area. And that's what they do. They tie them up, they put an insulated tarp on. Basically 15 degrees is kind of the threshold when the wood starts to die back. And so if you could keep that wood above 15 degrees, you will get better fig production. And uh... Two quick thoughts and two quick questions here in chat. Um, one is if you had any thoughts about a book from Ann Ralph, who's written about uh, significantly pruning fruit trees to keep them more manageable for home gardeners, <coughs> basically trimming them higher at a higher amount. And then the second question is recommendations for uh, what, uh, for I guess which types of dwarf apple trees would grow well around this area. Okay, so first question. Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, I, I've not heard of that book, but yes, that philosophy of pruning. Yeah, in some cases, you might be pruning three times a year, maybe four times a year. With espaliers, you're doing that. And with espaliers, you would manage your trees at a six to eight foot, maybe 10 foot level. So that certainly works. The key with pruning is don't prune when disease pressure is high, i.e. fire blight mainly, and don't prune wet wood. Uh, so that's kind of the big thing. And also it's going to work with comb fruits better than it does stone fruits. Yeah. And then as far as apples that do well around here, so uh, I'll go from kind of early ripening to late ripening. Pristine is a good golden apple, ripens early to mid-July. Um, let's see, Williams Pride is going to be a red apple that's going to be more of an August apple. Uh, Liberty is going to be a September apple. Liberty might be one that you've heard of a little bit more. A lot of folks are using that for cider making anymore. Um, but it's, it ripens almost purple when it's fully, fully ripe. It's kind, kind of great and has a really good flavor. Uh, Enterprise is a late September ripening fruit and a very large apple. Uh, these will sometimes get to be about a pound in size. So really, really kind of crazy. And then Sundance is also a late September, early October ripening gold apple. It gets a little bit of a pinkish blush. So those are kind of the top five, I would say. And do we have any final questions from the audience? Yeah. Ah, uh, Juliet. Yeah, Juliet uh, has and been. I've definitely noticed for sure. Now I've I've picked 
we have Juliet and Carmine side by side. Uh, Juliet also has a slightly bigger fruit. Uh, the, the deal is Carmine puts on boatloads. It's, it's just a big producer. Uh, Juliet only has maybe about two thirds to half as much fruit, but it's a bigger cherry and it's a slightly sweeter cherry. Questions about the pruning of the peaches. Yeah. I was wondering about the angle that you recommend for that for these structures. It seems like there's a fine line between it being too wide and open base and there's going to be flare. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. So, when you're, when you're, I feel like, yeah, because 90 degrees is 90 degrees doesn't work. That That's where it becomes too much and it is prone to split. And so coming off the central trunk, having 70 degrees, I think is good, kind of between 60 and 70 degrees. But realize that your central trunk is only going to go up maybe four feet. And then you're going to have all of these scaffolds coming out at sort of this, this 60, 70, and they'll be going upward. And as it's going upward, you'll be cutting off those upward portions so it goes outward more. And anything that sends a robust shoot up in through the middle, you end up taking that out. Yeah. And then as far as when you were saying the first two to first one to three years of with your whip, you first head it back. I had never heard of anyone saying that you're gonna head it back for each of the three years. I yeah. know we always heard just keep that central leader going. But so I'm wondering if then you've got your first cut. The central leader comes up, you're just going to cut that one back? You're going to cut that one back the next year. Yeah. So, probably. I guess. So, let's say we have, yeah, it's, it's yay, yay tall. Uh, well, you cut it back to here. You have, you know, three or four limbs come out, but you have one that is going to have that apical dominance and it grows, let's say, two to three feet. Then you would top it. Then below it, you have other scaffold limbs. And you have another one that exhibits apical dominance. And conceivably, you could go ahead and top that again and then get more branching out. At some point, you'll end up with a modified central leader unless you just keep going up and up with, uh, with those topping well, cuts. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah. too. Um, but that's one of the quickest ways, especially if you're doing an espalier, to get really good, perfect branching. And oftentimes when people see that done, they're like, oh, my God, you just cut that tree in half. Like, well, yeah, I did. But, but let's, let's, let's come here next year and take a look at it. And yeah. Yeah. The third question I had was about what they were about to have similarity with earlier teachers. I do. Um, what, uh, what do you, what would you like to know? <laughs> they, so, um, yeah, I, I think the, the biggest pest that they have is, is some of the, uh, lace bug pests on the foliage, uh, especially some years you'll just get an infestation of lace bugs and that'll, that'll cause, cause problems with the foliage. They produce wonderfully. And they're the kind of thing where they like really tight, wet soils. Uh, they don't like to get dried out so much, but they can handle dry soils. They're, they're fairly drought tolerant. But I think more importantly is they, they can handle the clay and the wet soils. Um, there are a lot of cultivated varieties out there that do well. Um, oh, and I, I'm blanking on them now. Uh, Galachinka is one, Nero, and uh, uh, Viking. Those are the three. And they get, you get really big berries. They're tough to process because they're so bitter. They need to be frozen first and then added to something. You don't want straight aronia berry. It's, it's just kind of... And since we're getting a little over time now, I just wanted to thank you for like coming by and, uh, and giving this great presentation. So let's give Matt a hand for a <laughs> Thank you. Turn over to the YouTube page and thank you all so much for attending.